Good evening, Admiral, Brigade, distinguished guest. It is my pleasure to introduce Honorable Carlos Del Toro, the 78th Secretary of the Navy. Born of Born in Havana, Cuba, he immigrated to the U.S. with his family as refugees in 1962. Raised in the Hell's Kitchen neighborhood in New York City, he attended public schools and received an appointment to United States Naval Academy as a member of the class of 1983. It was here he earned a bachelor's of science degree in electrical engineering. Upon graduation, Secretary de Toro was commissioned as a service warfare officer. His 22-year naval career included a series of critical appointments and numerous tours of sea duty, including the first commanding officer of the guided missile destroyer USS Buckley, EDG-84, senior executive assistant to the program director, analysis and evaluation in the office of the Secretary of Defense, and special assistant to the director and deputy director of the Office of Management and Budget, where he helped manage the budgets of the Department of Defense, U.S. Department of State, the Central Intelligence Agency, the Defense Intelligence Agency, the National Reconnaissance Office, and the Peace Corps. After retiring at the rank of commander, Secretary Del Toro founded SBG Technology Solutions Incorporated in 2004. As its CEO and president, he supported defense programs across a host of immediate and long-term Navy programs, including shipbuilding, AI, cybersecurity, acquisition programs, space systems, health, and training. Upon nomination by the President of the United States, Secretary Del Toro was confirmed in his current position August 7th of 2021. Welcome back, Mr. Secretary. I didn't need these when I was here. I, uh, before I begin, I, I just simply cannot tell you how humbled I am to be here before you today. And, and I want to recognize my first mate, my wife Betty, before I begin, of 38 years. We, 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 we met on a, on a blind date my, uh, my second class year, and, and I never looked back. I will admit she did have some hesitation at first, but she overcame that hesitation, thank God. <laughs> Midshipman Booker, thanks for that kind introduction and your, for your leadership of the brigade. To my dear friend and classmate, Vice Admiral Buck, it's great to be back here with you today. It was great to see you and Navy beat UCF this last Saturday. Now I'll tell you a little secret. Uh, I kind of whispered in the commandant's ear uh, earlier that he needed at the game, that he needed to make sure that you all got a free weekend, and I believe he gave it to you on this long weekend. Uh, so thank you, Commandant, wherever you are. As we approach the 39th anniversary of our graduation, who would have thought that we'd return to our beloved Annapolis together as Superintendent and Secretary of the Navy? Well, they may have seen a future superintendent and Admiral Buck, but I graduated more towards the lower half of my class, thanks largely to the EE department. It's the lower half that holds up the upper half of the class, right? But it was that very difficult academic choice that I made to become an electrical engineer, and my passion to serve that shaped me for the many challenges that I'd faced in both my military and my private sector careers. You see, coming to the Naval Academy was my chance to passionately repay the country that took me and my family in 
as refugees from Cuba in 1962. And electrical engineering was indeed a passion that motivated me. And I have no regrets for having pursued it. And my sincere hope is that you also will live your lives as well with no regrets. Never take the easy path at the expense of your passions. You've each already accomplished amazing things in your own lives. And you're well positioned for even more extraordinary achievements in the years ahead. But your service in the Navy and the Marine Corps will not be easy. The world today is dangerous, chaotic, and very complicated. When Admiral Buck and I entered the fleet in 1983, we thought we knew what the world looked like then. We were confident we can take on the entire world. We prepared for war against the Soviet Union. We knew the Cold War would come in some way direct the course of our own very careers. But just six months after we commissioned, a truck bomb in Beirut took the lives of three soldiers, 18 sailors, and 220 Marines. For the Corps, it was the worst loss of life in a single day since the Battle of Iwo Jima. And for our entire force, it was a tragic reminder that we never faced just one single potential adversary. But that didn't relieve us of the responsibility to train the, to fight the Soviet Union. We had to maintain global deterrence while also confronting terrorism and regional conflicts. We find ourselves today in a very similar situation. We have to prepare for both the primary threat as well as other dangers that are on the horizon. But instead of the Soviet Union, the pacing challenge that will define your naval careers today and tomorrow is the People's Republic of China. I know you've been hearing a lot about Beijing's military buildup, and with good reason. From cyber capabilities to anti-satellite missiles to integrated air defense to anti-ship ballistic missiles, they are advancing in every domain. Today, the People's Liberation Army Navy is the largest fleet in the world with around 350 ships. Complementing its fleet of modern surface combatants are hundreds of Coast Guard and maritime militia vessels. And with the development of anti-axis area denial capabilities, Beijing now threatens our ability to operate in the international waters of the first island chain. For the first time since the defeat of the Soviet Union, we have a strategic competitor with naval capabilities and capacities that rival and in some areas even surpass our own. But it's not just the ships and the weapons that concern me. It's what Beijing does as it strives to achieve leverage over its competitors. It uses every advantage in a coercive, extractive, and dangerously irresponsible manner. Beijing uses economic leverage like predatory lending to force governments from Asia to Africa to South America to cede critical infrastructure and natural resources. It uses diplomatic leverage to exact political retribution against other countries and to expand its sphere of influence. It leverages technology to steal personal information and intellectual property and subvert the free flow of communication around the world. And finally, it's using its military leverage to threaten its neighbors, challenge established norms, and attempt to control international waters as if they were their own. Now let me be clear, our hand will always be extended to any nation willing to support and defend the international norms that we all depend on. And the United States will always stand by our allies and partners in defending their right to be free. Our job is to preserve the peace by making sure that the People's Republic of China doesn't gain military leverage of the United States or our allies or our partners. We have to make the right investments today so that you, all of you, have the right capabilities tomorrow to deter and defeat any adversary. We must act with urgency now as we rise to meet these unprecedented challenges. It's this very sense of urgency that's the driving force behind the strategic guidance that I'm about to release this week to the Department of the Navy. Priority one of my strategic guidance is maintaining maritime dominance. Our global economy and the self-determination of free nations everywhere, especially in the Indo-Pacific, depends on sea power. That's the way it's been since the founding of our nation. There's a reason that the Constitution authorizes Congress to temporarily raise an army and permanently maintain a navy. Our young nation built the USS Constitution and five other frigates because we were getting attacked by Barbary pirates in the Mediterranean. Those warships later proved vital in the War of 1812 against the global power challenging our shoreline. 
The United States survived these ordeals because we made the right naval investments to deter both stateless terrorists and global powers. We must do the same thing now. Our security and our prosper prosperity depends on it. So we're building on Secretary of Defense Austin's vision of integrated deterrence with an agile and a ready force. We're building on General Berger's Force Design 2030 to modernize the expeditionary posture of the Marine Corps. And we're implementing Admiral Gil Day's navigation plan to expand our fleet capabilities for distributed operations. We're making tough decisions today to make sure future officers like you in this room have the right combination and the number of platforms and weapons for the full spectrum of threats tomorrow. But platforms and weapons are only worthwhile if they're ready when you need them. So we're investing in shipyards and maintenance facilities to keep ships and aircraft in the fight instead of in the shop. We're investing in technology that directs leads to amphibious maneuverability, dominance at sea, and resilient information superiority. Artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, unmanned platforms, directed energy, hypersonic weapons, distributed power. These are the frontiers that will define your advantage against the People's Republic of China, and it's crucial that we feel them expeditiously. We owe leaders like Grace Hopper and Hyman Rickover continued praise for our edge in information science and nuclear propulsion. But now I want to ask you, which of you will envision the next breakthrough idea that supports our maritime dominance? We need each and every one of you to be thought leaders and innovators, working alongside our partners and allies as global problem solvers. Indeed, the individual relationships that you form with our partners and our allies are one of the greatest advantages over authoritarian regimes in Beijing, in Moscow, in Tehran, and Pyongyang. So the next priority of my guidance I want to discuss is the importance of strengthening these very strategic partnerships. I was just in Newport participating in the International Sea Power Symposium. Navy leaders and heads of navies from every part of the globe were present. We had very direct conversations, and we didn't agree on everything. But we all agreed on the importance of working together to defend the rules-based international order. Unlike China and Russia, we don't treat our allies like client states or satellites. We treat them as the true partners that they are. Each nation brings to the fight their own experiences, capabilities, war fighting skills that help protect our mutual interests. You will have the opportunity to train and serve alongside leaders from other nations throughout your entire career. In fact, you're already doing so right here. And I want to take this opportunity to salute the international students that are here today. Would you please stand and be recognized? Thank you. I treasure the experiences that I had studying and serving alongside naval officers of other nations. Those are the friendships that hold true today. There is no substitute for the shared experiences of allies working together to deter our adversaries. Because it's not just the United States Navy or our Navy and Marine Corps that are under threat from Beijing and from Moscow. It's the entire framework for peaceful coexistence. And we cannot leave that challenge unanswered and undeterred. Through maritime dominance and strengthened partnerships, we will strengthen the fabric of our international rules-based order. But as I said before, there is the primary threat as well as other dangers on the horizon. Climate change is one of those dangers and a priority that our strategy will address. Our entire world is under growing pressure from receding shorelines, extreme weather, natural resource constraints that could only increase conflicts amongst nations. In the Arctic, new sea lanes are opening up with new opportunities for commerce, but also, unfortunately, new potential for conflict. The People's Republic of China is seeking to assert its influence in the Arctic as well, referring to themselves as a near Arctic state. China, a near Arctic state? That's like calling Annapolis a near Caribbean city. But speaking of Annapolis, You know, my wife told me when I became Secretary of the Navy, you'd all laugh at my jokes, but. <laughs> speaking of Annapolis, but speaking of Annapolis, in all seriousness, did you ever think you'd see a tornado on West Street? 
Climate change is leading to bigger storms and greater disasters right here at home, as well as where we operate globally. We need you to pilot our fleet through rougher seas, bigger storms, rising seas, and changing shorelines. We need your leadership as the world contends with greater disasters, water scarcity, food scarcity, and more aggressive competition for resources. The climate crisis is a destabilizing global force. We must plan and prepare for its impact alongside our allies and our partners. We need your analytic skill and operational foresight to ensure that our warfighting capability and ability to adapt. We need you to build resilient infrastructure and better logistics webs. And we need your creativity to extend our sustainability with more efficient fuels, better batteries, and smarter conservation. We're counting on your spirit of innovation and ability to draw out the problem-solving capacity in sailors and Marines that you will lead. So the final priority I wish to discuss this evening is that of empowering our people. Our Navy and Marine Corps team demands leaders with the highest intellectual, ethical, and warfighting capabilities. From the moment you set foot in your first command, you'll be immediately responsible for others, sailors, Marines, and their families. Conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the trust placed in you by your nation at all times. Act with integrity in all that you do, even when others are not watching. Be bold, take action. Decisions you make will impact the lives entrusted to your leadership. Decisions you make will deter our adversaries. You will make mistakes, learn from those mistakes. Your course of study here is just the beginning of your responsibility to be lifelong students. While in uniform, I studied national security at the Navy War College, space systems engineering at the Navy Postgraduate School, and legislative affairs at George Washington University. Every one of those experiences helped me become a better leader and a more effective problem solver. I even got better grades, <laughs> who would have thought? But the greatest education that I received while in service was from my sailors, especially the chief's mess. So while we invest in great institutions like the academy, we're also advancing ready, relevant education for all of our personnel. This year, we established the US Naval Community College to expand access for our sailors and our Marines to learn while they serve. Always push those you lead to seize every learning opportunity, challenge assumptions, take risks. Remember to always look out for your troops and their families. Look out for their physical health as we finish the fight against COVID and other challenges. Check in on their mental health and encourage them to seek care when they need it. Always prepare them to be better warriors while also being empathetic towards others. Set the example amongst your peers with the dignity and respect you extend to every one of your classmates, every one of them, no matter where they come from, how they look, how they speak, how they worship, or who they love. Throughout our history, we've only grown stronger when we have expanded opportunities for all to serve. So our strategy will invest in recruiting and retention and promoting the best America has to offer to build the strongest possible warfighting team. It is my expectation that you will inspire and lead this effort at every level of command, starting here at the academy. The way you conduct yourself on the yard will directly translate to how you lead in the fleet and the Corps. That's especially true in the fight against the scourge of sexual harassment and assault from within our force. As a leader, you are expected to set the standard and hold others accountable regardless of rank or position. A command culture that tolerates harassment increases the danger of assault. The data proves it. Deep down, you already know it. So it's on you to model respect. Your sailors, Marines, and civilian employees will follow the examples that you set because yours is an example that's worth following. Respecting people empowers them, and the collective power of our people is our ultimate advantage over authoritarian regimes. I know because I was born in a communist dictatorship. My father was jailed twice for challenging assumptions and questioning authority. We came here for a different life and we found it. The genius of the American experiment has always been the creativity and the drive of a free people. To ensure these liberties, we must ensure our national security. For the Department of the Navy, our mission is quite simple. We deliver combat-ready naval forces to campaign, to turn as necessary, win conflicts, and win wars. So our course is clear. To overcome the threats and achieve this mission, we must maintain maritime dominance. We will do so by strengthening our strategic partnerships and empowering our incredible people. I am honored to be your Secretary of the Navy and serve by your side. Remember what I said at the beginning. 
Never take the easy path at the expense of your passions. And the fact that you've chosen to pursue your passions on the banks of the Severn tells me all I need to know about you. Thank you all for your commitment to this great nation. I am confident that the leadership our Navy and Marine Corps requires to answer every challenge is right here in this room. May God bless each of you and your families. Thank you. Would you assist me in taking some questions? Come on, I know you're not shy. Uh, sir, Midshipman Third Class Alex Koala. Yesterday, we had a discussion with Commander Ledford and Jocko Willink about doing the right thing even when it's unpopular. I was wondering if you, sir, had anything to share on how to go about disseminating an unpopular order onto your subordinates. Thank you, sir. You mean how to deal with an unpopular order that's been passed to your, to your subordinates? Is that what you're asking me? I'm sorry, I can't see where you are. I'm right here, sir. And okay. yes, sir, exactly. Okay, good. <laughs> Not a, I'm not in favor of passing on unpopular uh, orders, you know. So yes, I think you know in my career and all of your careers, you're going to be faced. You're going to face times when um, there are difficult choices that need to be made, and you're going to be posed sometimes with unpopular orders that may not necessarily be the norm of what's expected. And the first and foremost important thing that I think the conclusion that you have to draw about what you're being asked to do is first and foremost is, is it ethical, right? Am I being given an ethical order? Am I begin, being given an order that's a morally correct order? And if it isn't, then you have a hard choice to make in your own heart about whether you're going to follow that order or not, or choose to perhaps even resign your position because you just don't believe that it's a ethical, moral, legal order. However, I think that in most cases, you may not necessarily agree with the direction that your commanding officer is going. And I think it's important to take a very mature perspective at that moment in time, and it's sometimes tough to do, but to take a mature perspective and put your shoes Put yourself in the shoes of the commander giving the order and try to understand what he or she is going through under these difficult circumstances so you could better understand why perhaps that commander is asking you to do something that's very unpopular. It's always easy to do the, the easy things and the popular things, right? But to choose a course that's not popular takes a real leader to execute. So I, I hope that gives you a little bit of my perspective about you know, what one should do under those circumstances. Thank you, sir. Just start asking the questions. We can't see you well from here. Hello, sir. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm Mitchman Sang Class Hilaire. <laughs> Sir, so I'm here to talk to you about Beijing's rising influence around the world. I know we've heard stirrings of the Uyghur Muslims. We've seen the islands. We saw Hong Kong. They're ramping it up in Taiwan. What does our response look like? Where does the buck stop? I'm, I'm not the most informed, and I, I try to read up as much as I can, but is it, what is our strategic plan? It seems like China's kind of going unchecked but maybe not necessarily. Um, but on the other end, if, if our response isn't a fight, what does coexistence look like? So the desired goal, quite frankly, is not to fight China. No one wants to enter into a conflict. Many of the folks sitting here to my left, retired admirals and captains and so forth, many of them know what it is to fight in war and conflict. And we don't desire that with China. But it's our ultimate responsibility to deter them from what they're trying to accomplish. 
including taking over Taiwan. And it's so incredibly important, as I said in my opening statement, that we make the investments now, this year, as necessary, to actually be able to focus more so on China than many of the other threats that we sometimes face around the world. And these are difficult challenges. We've pulled ourselves out of Afghanistan. That doesn't mean that terrorism is just going to go away. It's going to rear its ugly head somewhere, either in the Middle East or elsewhere around the world. And so it's incredibly important, however, for our Navy to be able to, so, to some extent pivot to the Indo-Pacific and to work closely with our allies and our partners with countries like Australia, India, the Philippines, Indonesia, many of the other countries in the Indo-Pacific who are being threatened, and to provide the necessary arms and weapons and technology necessary for Taiwan to be able to defend itself as well. So that China can look around and basically say, we don't have any friends. We don't have any maritime allies who will work with us. Perhaps this isn't the right choice to make. And it, hopefully that will deter them from what some believe is their ultimate goal, which is to take Taiwan. Next question. Yeah, thank you, sir. I appreciate your time. Yes, sir. Sir, midshipman for first class gross, third company. Um, you talked a little bit about climate change. Both Norfolk and the Naval Academy are projected to be underwater by the end of the century. Uh, the number one emission from the Navy, as well as most of the civilian sector, falls under transportation. The Navy is obviously reliant upon tr transportation via fossil fuels for our ships, our vehicles, our aircraft. How do you suggest that the Navy as a whole minimizes its carbon footprint in order to preserve these institutions without damaging our operational readiness? So, excellent question. Thank you. And obviously, it takes an all of government effort. This isn't just the Navy has to work on it. It's the entire globe, actually. Right? So we have to commit to, to the right uh, agreements worldwide. Uh, so that we can all work together to achieve this goal. We have to invest in the right technology, and that means making major investments now that will hopefully provide return on investments a few years from now, like biofuels and things of that nature. You know, it's just something as, as simple as when I was a commanding officer on the Bulkley, you know, there was a bulbous bow that we had, basically, and there was a stern flap. It was a very simple um, flap on the back of the stern, it was as simple as that. And because of the fluid dynamics that flowed across the propeller, that particular very low-cost addition to the ship saved thousands and thousands and thousands of fuel oil, actually. So it's investment in technology and windmills wherever we can, obviously, and other places that we have to invest in that. And we are investing in that technology now so that we can try to you know, reduce our carbon footprint everywhere we go. And, you know, in the world, in the Navy that I lived in, we just didn't pay attention to this at all. And now when you actually sail and you're not in an operational mission that requires you to go fast, and I always like to go fast, but nevertheless, when you're in an operational mission which doesn't require you to go fast, well, then you steam at the most economical, you know, speed, basically. In my case, it was somewhere between 12 and 16 knots. And so we pay attention to it. And just by that action alone, we would save millions of dollars across the entire Navy. So it takes a, a whole you know, Navy effort, basically, and us working globally with our partners and allies to just apply these sometimes simple technological advance, advancements, but often very complicated investments that we're making at the Office of Naval Research, for example, and the Navy Research Lab to try to come up with those uh, savings. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Hello, sir. Midshipman First Class Bailey, Fourth Company. On my first class cruise this summer, a common issue that was brought up between the officers was retention of commission officers after their five to ten year commitment. As you just mentioned, sir, one of the elements we are looking to improve is that retention piece. What exactly does improvement for the retention of officers look like in the next five to ten years? Well, it all starts with leadership. Uh, how many of, of you folks are graduating next year? <laughs> starts with you 
in the comments that I made in my speech. It's really about you setting the right standard, about just not be willing to sort of do the minimum that it takes to survive on a ship or a Marine, when you join the Marine Corps uh, or a submarine, but trying to inspire those that you're leading, right? Trying to build a team that you care about, that you show emp empathy towards, that they know that you really care about them from the day that they walk on board that ship to the day that they leave, and that you go above and beyond the call of duty to understand the men and women that you have a responsibility over. That's where it starts. And to provide inspiring leadership, okay? And to have fun as well. Yes, we all work hard in the Navy. There's no question about it. And sometimes we do things that don't make sense, and we're trying to correct some of that as well, too. You know, some of our processes are way too bureaucratic, and we, we're taking a look across the Navy, in fact, to see where we can try our best to sort of minimize some of the bureaucracy, right, so that we can focus on developing your warfighting skills, right? A dedication to the mission. I gotta tell you, my first day as Secretary of the Navy, I had the opportunity to go down to Norfolk, Virginia. I took the off, oath of office at seven o'clock the previous night at the Yojima Memorial, and at five o'clock in the morning, I was on a plane with the Chief of Naval Operations to go down to Norfolk to witness what was a large-scale exercise. It was incredible. It was like nothing that I had seen in my naval career. It was incredible. I mean, we had three fleets basically working together. I mean, it was, it was a lot of fun. It was just amazing what we were doing there. And I think that that's the experience that young men and women want to have when they first show up at their first command in the Navy or the Marine Corps, right? And they want to be inspired by good leaders. We got to make it fun, too, across your entire careers. You know, I had the, I had, the, I was a surface warfare officer, so I grew up on ships. But when I wasn't on ships, when I went off to the Navy postgraduate school, I got a degree in space systems engineering. It was a Navy subspecialty code, okay? Each and every one of you should be looking at what education you're going to achieve throughout your careers, even after you graduate here. And I know you're not going to be thinking about going back to school as soon as you graduate here. But soon after, start thinking about where you want to develop that subspecialty. For me, it was space. So after my department head tours, I became program manager of a, a, what we refer to as a special access program, top secret program, okay? On the black side, I can't talk to you about it. But on the, black, on the white side of it, I ran a satellite ground station with 40 engineers that basically were the backup satellite ground station for the Clementine satellites. Now, Clementine were two series of satellites in the, in the 80s that basically mapped the face of the moon. And Clementine II was basically in orbit when I was there. And we discovered traces of, of water on the pole of the moon. How cool is that? Right? As a surface washer officer to have that experience. And there are officers across the Navy and the Marine Corps today that when they're not fulfilling their primary responsibility on a ship or in armor or in infantry, wherever they may go, they're exploring subspecialties that are incredibly valuable to you. And then you take that experience with you everywhere that you go. So I believe that that's the way that we retain folks, by making sure that they have that they understand that the Navy is a huge return on investment in their own future. And I think that's, that's the key to success. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. <laughs> sir, good evening. My name is Michigan Second Class Eli Walls. I'm from 25th Company, and I use uh, they, them pronouns. Um, you my, got a fan uh, club somewhere here, huh? What's that, sir? I said you got a fan club here. <laughs> um, Sir, so recently, for the past two days, uh, midshipmen have been taking part in the diversity conference. It's the second annual conference. And something important that we raised was how important it is to have a diverse Navy to be able to answer the, the, these difficult questions that are being raised globally to provide different perspectives. So my question to you is, what are, you, what are your plans for making the Navy a more inclusive place, sir? Thank you. Well, let me first start off by saying how important diversity is to our combat readiness. 
it's incredibly important to any organization. And, they, and I served in the private sector for 17 years. And having diversity, whether it be in your company or whether it be in the Navy for that matter, uh, diversity of thought that comes from diversity of experience, that comes from diversity of perspective, that comes from the diversity of your background, is incredibly important. Whether it's ethnic, gender, color, religion, who you love, all of that diversity is incredibly important for the strength of our Navy. Because the more that you understand the sailors and Marines that you lead, the better that you understand where they come from and what they've been through in their own lives before they came here to the academy, before they come to your ships, your submarines, your squadrons, the stronger an officer that you will be because you understand them. And you will be able to build trust between those that you lead. And that's fundamental to being a good leader. So in my humble opinion, for the Navy, it's important that we recruit from diverse backgrounds across the nation. West Coast, East Coast, Middle America. But the Navy does a pretty good job of that. We need to recruit African Americans, Hispanics, Polish Americans, Italian Americans, Indian Americans, from everywhere in America. It's what makes our country great. And so for as long as I'm Secretary of the Navy, I'm going to make sure that we have the right investments in place so that everybody in this country has an equal opportunity to come here to the, to the United States Naval Academy and can serve in our Navy and Marine Corps very proudly. Thank you, sir. To your left, sir. Last question? Yeah, to, your left. to your left. Good evening, sir. Midshipman Second Class Vincent Abrams. The PRC is indisputably our 21st century uh, adversary, as you've indicated. Recently, they've mobilized their largest fighter sortie ever, consisting of 56 attack aircraft over Taiwan, threatening their sovereignty. We've been strategically ambivalent regarding the Taiwanese question since the Nixon administration. Is it time that we take a definite stance on tai, uh, Taiwanese sovereignty, or what is the alternative, sir? Good question. <laughs> you must be a political science major, maybe. That would be correct, sir. Ah, there we go. It's so incredibly important for us to always be revisiting our policies, okay? Our policy has actually held fast for many decades in preventing conflict with China, okay? It's been very successful, actually. It's maintained the peace in the South China Seas and across the Taiwan Straits. But obviously, something has changed, and it's been going on for the last 10 years and so it's incredibly important as leaders, especially civilian leaders, for us to always be revisiting the policy to make sure that we either tweak it, change it, or get rid of it. And I would argue that as China continues to do the things that it does, that we're going to continue to revisit that policy to make sure that we're pursuing a policy that serves our national security interests and the economic interests of the entire world, quite frankly. So what you're talking about is a topic that's incredibly important for us to consider in very serious ways. And perhaps the policy will stay exactly like it is. But it's important to continuously revisit that policy, and I'm sure that we're doing that. Thank you, sir. Good evening, sir. Midshipman Second Class, Mateo Simpson, First Company. Um, my question is, considering our strategy of fostering alliances in the Indo-Pacific to deter China, how do we ensure that China believes that we all honor our alliances in the case of something like an invasion of Taiwan? Well, our, our actions today mean a lot, right? 
Talk is cheap. What you do is critically important, especially when your allies need you. So we're having discussions with Taiwan. We're having discussions with every country in the Indo-Pacific to find ways that we can more closely work together and come up with ideas, technology, ways that we can collaborate together more strongly, operationally speaking as well too. If, you, if you're aware of the, the submarine deal that was struck basically with the Australians, for example, that's a game changer. Provides Australia the nuclear-powered submarines that they need to be far more effective in combatant in the Indo-Pacific and around the world, right? So we're trying our very best to be as creative as possible to use all these measures to tell China, basically, that we're just not going to allow these things to continue. You've heard Price, Price, uh, President Biden say it. You've heard Vice President say it and the Secretary of Defense say it. And we're implementing the steps that are necessary so that we bring credible deterrence to the table in every possible way that we can. Thank you. Uh-oh, she's got a book with her. <laughs> Sarah Machiman, 4th Class Kasanovich, 28th Company. Um, I, was <laughs> uh, I was curious, how do you see the defense posture in the United States changing with the heightened tensions in cyberspace by our nation state actors? I I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part of your question. Um, sir, how do you see the defense posture in the United States changing with the heightened tensions um, in cyberspace by our nation state actors? Yeah. So without question, uh, the world has changed many times since I was a student here, and cyber is certainly one of those, right? And uh, it's obvious that Russia and China and many other countries have embraced cyber in a really threatening way. Uh, but so have we. We have made major investments in cybersecurity, okay? Much of it classified, but very critical to our national security as well. While I can't talk about it here on stage, I assure you that we have and continue and will continue to develop cybersecurity capabilities that are truly impressive as well, too. And so we have to be able to meet the challenge that they present. It's a very complicated environment. For those of you who study cybersecurity know how challenging it can be. But our country has to make those investments. We have to fight on every front, on space, cyber, on the land, on sea, under the sea, above the sea, everywhere. It, it takes all of those efforts collectively for us to be successful. And there are major investments that we're making in cybersecurity. Thank you, sir. Okay. How about in the back, in the middle? Good evening, sir. Michigan First Class Williams, 22nd Company. As, as we shift our focus to China from the wars in the Middle East and Southwest Asia, how do we plan on utilizing lessons learned from our strategic failures in Afghanistan that led to the capitulation to a Taliban government in future fights against the PRC and plan? Excellent question. You know, when I went to the Navy War College, you know, Sun Tzu and others tell, tell you, Mahan, that it's very likely that the war you fight next, or quite frankly, the war that you try to prevent next, will look quite differently from the conflict that you had in the past. But yet, it's so incredibly important for our nation's leaders, both uniformed and civilian, to learn the hard lessons and mistakes that were made in the past. And I take those very, very seriously. You know, one of the solemn responsibilities that I have as Secretary of the Navy and all senior civilian leaders and military leaders in our armed forces have is that the decisions that we make have a direct impact on people's lives. We actually send our armed services into conflict. And we, as senior civilian leaders, have a, a responsibility to make sure that we truly understand the strategy. That we understand, as we move into a conflict, what the exit strategy will look like. And that only then, 
or will we apply the resources that are necessary to achieve our national security interests? Because when we don't, we're not successful. And so we have a responsibility in the Department of Defense, in our country in general, in our government, to take a hard look at the lessons of Afghanistan over the last 20 years and try to learn lessons that we don't, or try to learn the mistakes that we don't repeat in the future. And it's not easy. And we're going to spend years doing this. And that's healthy. It's healthy for our nation. It's healthy for our armed services. It's healthy for each and every one of you. You know, I reflect back when I was sitting here in 1983, we were about 10 to 15 years out of Vietnam. And I remember my own company commander, Lieutenant Commander Gluting, was a riverboat, cap, um, riverboat captain in, in, uh, in Vietnam. And I remember the lessons that he would share with us about Vietnam. And those always stayed true to me. One of the lessons that he passed on to me is a lesson that I hopefully passed on to you earlier here today, which was basically take care of your people. Take care of your people, because they will take care of you. And when you go in, hopefully you'll never have to go into conflict and war. But if you're required to do so, it's them that will be by your side. It's those sailors and Marines that you will teach to lead as young junior officers that will have your back. And that's why I emphasize that you have to earn their trust in every possible way. The character that you demonstrate as young junior officers in the years ahead will define the leader that you will be and the very integrity of our naval service. Thank you. Is that it? Excellent. Another round of applause for the secretary, please. <laughs> Sir, I think your words tonight serves as a reminder um, that we sometimes forget every day is that everything we do here, everything that we endure, is to prepare us to join the fleet so we can take on that monumental task that you mentioned earlier to protect America and their allies. And we can't thank you enough for sharing that with us. So a small token of our appreciation, we have a gift. So it's my understanding also that um, we're going to be doing some spirit spots for that other football game that's coming down in December, I believe. I think it's called Army Navy. And it's what I'm going to challenge you to do here tonight is to come up with ideas uh, to engage me in a spirit spot between now and then. Okay. So, so you work with the brigade here and come up with great ideas for us to be able to do that spirit spot, and we'll film it, and uh, we'll do a lot of other fun things too along those lines. But I want to finish where I began. I'm so humbled to be here with each and every one of you, and I wish you all the very best and luck and success throughout your careers. Thank you. <laughs>